Hello, space friends, Captain Snuggles here, bringing you the new and improved inaugural episode of X4 Oversimplified. This game is insanely complicated. Any video less than an hour long is probably oversimplified, so I can slap that label on anything, but I really am going to try to boil things down to the bare minimum, and then boil them down some more. This series is mainly meant for new players, not as a comprehensive guide, but just to whet the appetite to lay the groundwork for future learning. I've revised this episode from its original version to bring it more in line with the standards of the rest of the Oversimplified series. So I'm going to kick off this series, again, by oversimplifying the lore of each of the major factions. I want to give you just a little info on their species, their societies, their governments, and their ships. Enough to give you a general idea of what to expect, but leaving you plenty more to discover as you play through the game. First up, let's start off with a crowd favorite, the Queendom of Boron. The Boron are vegetarian fish people who hover around in water-filled spacesuits. They are optimists, pacifists, and scientists by nature, and more importantly, they are precious little goobers who can do no wrong. Their government is a beloved and benevolent monarchy, but don't let their kindness fool you. They are very, very capable of defending themselves if threatened. Anyone cruel enough to attack them will face some of the most powerful military ships in the universe, as well as my personal wrath. Long live Queen Polyphides, and of course, Long life and good health to our brilliant supervisor, hero of the Boron people, Bosota. And who would be cruel enough to attack the Boron? Well, that would be these guys. The Split families are the mortal enemies of the Boron, for good reason. The Split revel in violence and cruelty. Their culture, like their ship designs, revolves around all-out aggression. Technically, there are several different split factions and numerous subsidiary clans, but they're all about the same. They own slaves, they eat whales, they decide their leadership through massive fleet death matches. Historically, it was canon that their ships were fueled by the suffering of living beings. They even nuked their own homeworld into oblivion. They're so absurdly evil that they somehow end up being lovable. They're just a bunch of cartoonishly violent numbskulls out there living their best lives. Speaking of lovable, look at this little guy. The Taladi are semi-aquatic, semi-immortal space lizards who love money. They are clever, greedy, and absolutely unscrupulous. They always find a way to make a profit for themselves and for their business partners. And they're always looking for new business partners. If you ever hit rock bottom, a Talati will be there to help you get back on your feet. Or a fair share, of course. Most Talati fall under the so-called government of the Talati Company, which is essentially a loosely organized megacorporation that only actually governs when it's financially convenient. That being said, the Ministry of Finance doles out what little law and order exists in Talati sectors. The concepts of law and order are so foreign to the Talati that ministry agents have to be conditioned from birth, and I'm pretty sure they would still abandon their posts for a five credit bribe. Moving on, the God Realm of the Paranid is a theocracy consisting of arrogant, three-eyed, double-jointed weirdos who are obsessed with Scientology. They have a heavily caste-based society that revolves around the worship of something called the Holy Three-Dimensionality. That society has, at various points, produced some great heroes, some great villains, and some great scientists. Which one of those they produce the most of at any given time depends heavily on who's in charge. Currently, there are actually two people in charge. The Holy Order of the Pontifex consists of the same race, with the same religion, but under a different holy leader, which makes them the mortal enemies of the God Realm. 
Some people claim the whole schism was fabricated to fuel the military-industrial complex, but those so-called whistleblowers have all gone strangely silent after meeting with the Talati Company. And it's a good thing, too, because if the Paranid factions ever set aside their differences, they would be just about unstoppable. Now, as a brief aside, we are focusing on the major empires, but there are some minor factions as well. We have the Ice Mafia, the Recycling Experts, the Space Librarians, the Space Libertarians, the Cyborg Pirates, the Lizard Pirates, the Scientology Pirates, and the Sore Losers. Out of those, the Vigor Syndicate and the Riptide Rakers come the closest to being major factions, but despite owning a bit of territory, they just don't have the same geopolitical clout that the other entries on our list do. Regardless, all of these minor factions are cool in their own way, and some of them do have important places in the lore. Now, buckle up, because we have arrived at the major human factions. These guys have the most complex, nuanced, and long-running lore out of all the factions, and they're generally portrayed as being less cartoonish than the alien races. So, we'll be spending just a little extra time on them, and turning up the seriousness just a notch. First up, we have the Argon Federation, a militaristic parliamentary democracy seated on the ancient colony world of Argon Prime. The Argon are descended from the greatest warriors in history, a nation cobbled together from a ragtag band of freedom-loving fighter pilots who were forced to fight for survival again and again, and who won again and again, through skill and sheer determination. They are the only faction ever to defeat the Xenon in a major campaign, and they've done it three times. But that was in the past. These days, they're still some of the greatest warriors in the X-Universe, still a ragtag band of freedom-loving flyboys at heart, but now they're trying to run a major government, and it's going about as well as you'd expect. They throw themselves with reckless ferocity at any and all enemies of freedom, stretching their military dangerously thin, while on the home front their obsession with liberty allows splinter groups and even whole sectors to just break away at random. The only reason their fragmented nation hasn't completely collapsed is their secret service. Once upon a time, the Argon Secret Service was a pragmatic yet principled moderating element amidst the wild heroics of the rest of the faction. In more recent history, though, they've shown that they're willing to go to dangerous extremes when the Federation is pushed to its absolute limit. We haven't heard much from them lately, but they're still around, and I doubt anyone's looking forward to the day they make their presence known again. On a lighter note, one of the Argon breakaway groups is the Antigone Republic, a group of systems that accidentally seceded from the Federation, and the Argon just haven't made much effort to bring them back into the fold. Compared to their parent faction, they focus a little more on trade and a little less on violence, but nevertheless, they're very much cut from the same cloth. Their neighbors, however, are a very different story. Once upon a time, there were an awful lot of undesirables hanging around the solar system. And so the Terran government decided to round them all up and put them in what they called Pioneer Settlement. Those settlements just so happened to be in the harshest environments in the system, as far away as possible from the good Terrans. So, one might make the mistake of thinking they were actually internment camps. But no, they were pioneer settlements. And so, the Sagaris detainees, uh, I mean the Sagaris pioneers, were born. Now, after decades in the camps of the settlements, they finally have their own territory and are a proud, independent nation. They have their own government and can make whatever policies they want, as long as the Terrans give them permission first. They have their own economy and can buy whatever they want, as long as the Terrans give them permission first. They have their own military, and are free to defend themselves. 
as long as the Terrans give them permission first. Sarcasm aside, they are a de facto vassal state, completely subservient to the Terran Protectorate, and they are not thrilled with the situation. In an effort to gain actual independence, they have thrown themselves wholeheartedly into research and exploration, placing themselves at the forefront of scientific development, but in the process, they've bent some rules that their overlords would really rather not see bent. Which brings us, finally, to the most complicated faction of all, the Terrans themselves. The Terran Protectorate is a militaristic authoritarian faction, the iron-fisted ruler of Earth, and the only nation that wasn't crippled by the Jumpgate shutdown. Its people are descended from the survivors of a self-inflicted apocalypse, haunted by the knowledge that they unleashed the Xenon Scourge upon the universe, and making up for that mistake has been their thousand-year mission. That mission has gone completely wrong from day one. As the Terrans have blundered through their quest for redemption, they've inadvertently hurt themselves and helped the Xenon over and over and over. Every defeat has added to their collective shame, deepened their government's despotism, and led to increasingly bloody and senseless outcomes. In the most insane example of this, they spent eight centuries preparing for a grand war against the Xenon, but when the time came, they attacked everyone except the Xenon. And then they lost, sacrificing their entire navy, most of their military infrastructure, and 800 years of preparation for exactly zero gain. Long story short, they've been spiraling for almost a millennium. Now, finally, there are some signs that some people within the Terran government are trying to pull the Protectorate out of its self-destructive spiral. It still represses its citizens, but it has added some token flexibility to its caste system. It is still abysmal at diplomacy, but it has played nice once or twice. It still indirectly helps the Xenon, but it's finally making a serious effort to fight them as well. And it's about time because the clock is ticking. The Terrans have always enjoyed superpower status thanks to the advanced technology they inherited from Old Earth but their technological edge has grown disturbingly narrow. Their old guard is still blundering ahead with the same old mistakes, but some up-and-comers within the Protectorate are slowly making changes, seeming to realize that this may be their last chance at redemption. Whether they achieve that redemption is, at least partially, up to you. And they're not the only ones. Your actions can shape the fate of just about every faction in the game. This guide has truly been oversimplified, but I hope it's given you a tantalizing glimpse of the friends, enemies, and opportunities that await you in the X universe. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you'll tune in next time. And until then, this is Captain Snuggles, signing off.